Okay, we're back with a special Global Connections here on a given Tuesday afternoon. And we have Carlos Juarez hooked up by remote. We are so happy to have him because there are questions we'd like to ask him. Hi, Carlos. Hello, Jay, and good to see we. Well, good to connect here. I'm joining you from uh, Puebla, Mexico. And, uh, you know, we live in interesting times. Of course, uh, Mexico in the news these last few days with the negotiations, and if you can call it that, or basically the announcement of a, of a new deal with Mexico uh, addressing, uh, you know, the migrant crisis, but also combining, uh, you know, tough talk on trade, right? Tariff, uh, the weaponization of tariffs, as some have called it. Yeah, indeed. And that's where you get to shoot yourself in the foot um, and, and wind up having your own people pay what amounts to a tax. Uh, and in the, in, in the process, you would destroy existing, uh, you know, affirmative relations with every country around, uh, including countries that have been our close allies for years. And the thing about Mexico is that Mexico, like Canada, they're our border neighbors. They're very important to us. I was thinking on the way in, gee whiz, you know, back in the day uh, when, you know, the Russians got involved in Cuba, that was a great threat. And it's a great threat now that the Russians and the Chinese are involved in Venezuela. But can you imagine just as a possibility that the Russians got involved in Mexico, if Mexico became disaffected, uh, you know, from the United States and welcomed Russians and Chinese who set up bases, that would be the biggest threat to American security you could possibly imagine. So you guys are our buddies. Mexico is an important ally, an important neighbor, you know, always, forever, and integrated into our whole country. You know, the Mexican culture is a big part of the American culture. Why are we making you a scapegoat? Uh, why, are we, why are we pushing Mexico around like this? Do you have an answer for me? Well, let me clarify it. It's not we, it's Donald Trump, because, you know, Mexico and the U.S. have a very longstanding, complex relationship. I would turn to uh, some interesting, I was rereading re an interesting interview uh, some time ago of the famed uh, chef uh, now who's now left us, Anthony Bourdain, in which he talks about Mexico, a country that is so poorly understood in the U.S., but is such an important player. You know, Americans love the food. They love the culture. Uh, you know, any restaurant in the U.S. is, you know, very basically depending on uh, whether it's a chef or, a, uh, you know, the service cooks or whatever. Uh, but more than that, I mean, I think uh, it's a complex uh, relationship and interdependence, of course. But since Donald Trump came strolling down that escalator almost four years ago now, obviously Mexico has taken a pretty tough beating. And it, and it is Donald Trump uh, and maybe his, you know, reality TV show that has painted Mexico as this, uh, you know, this place of, uh, well, uh, uh, I mean, there's no question there are challenges here and insecurity and violence and, and drug wars and all of that. But, uh, you know, the, the way in which Trump has portrayed it has, has really, really been, uh, I think it has damaged the relations. And let's hope it's not something that uh, will be irreversible. But uh, I think there are a lot of vested interests. I mean, obviously, even the business community, in light of this recent uh, sort of tariff war, has pushed back very strongly, even many Republicans saying that's not the way you do it. However, I mean, uh, they've now announced a so-called deal. We don't have a lot of detail about it. It remains murky. Uh, but uh, clearly his new use of these uh, sort of tariffs to threaten and push Mexico has uh, forced them to bend and, and, you know, some would even say appease uh, this president. So, well, uh, it's a tough, complex set of issues. Let's try to unravel some of them. And I'm uh, looking forward to offering some perspectives maybe from Mexico that uh, aren't always at the forefront of the uh, U.S. Uh, media uh, because it's, you know, it's widely talked about here. This is obviously headline news here as we speak. Well, you know, I, I just wonder how people feel. I mean, uh, in uh, 20, January 2017, our relationship with Mexico, at least to my knowledge, was pretty robust. And I think you were you there at the time you were living in Puebla at the time. Uh, you, you can yes. say how, how it was. Now people felt about the U.S. And how about the how about the Mexican government felt about the U.S.? Can you track for us how that has changed the kinds of things that have happened vis-a-vis -vis the relationship, the diplomatic and people-to-people -people relationship with the U.S. Mm. and Mexico since January 2017. Well, and you're speaking there of the inauguration of Trump. I would, you know, uh, you know, go back to the summer before when he announced his candidacy. That was the beginning of a pretty, you know, ugly, uh, you know, set of words uh, that Mexico, you know, only sends rapists and drug, uh, you know, lords and whatever. Uh, maybe some of their best, but not really. But then, of course, the election occurs. And that was seen with, like everywhere else, considerable dismay here because of the uncertainty it brought. So he's elected and gets inaugurated in January. And 
you know, relations have been pretty tough. Uh, traditionally, any new president in Mexico or in the U.S., one of their first foreign visits is usually to meet with their counterpart. They go to Ottawa for a quick lunch or they meet at the border or maybe the Mexican president might visit the U.S. That has not happened. They have never met uh, to this date. Moreover, I would even remind you, uh, given the, you know, the uh, many vacancies in the U.S. government, to this date, we still do not have a U.S. ambassador in Mexico, one of the most important trading partners and, uh, you know, and, and allies. And there is an acting, you know, charge d'affaires, but no uh, approved by ambassador. But that aside, I mean, the relationship has been uh, uh, interesting to see because it, it came at a time when Mexico itself is also transitioned to a new president. Uh, in about a year ago in July, they elected a new uh, populist from the left, a leftist leader, the first uh, to come to Mexico in quite a long time. He was inaugurated now in December. So he's been in office about six months. Uh, he has not had any real, you know, uh, interaction with Trump whatsoever. And his uh, main focus has been domestic, domestic agenda. Uh, and as much as he he's tried to avoid Trump, in fact, he's had a pretty good strategy just to not pay much attention and sort of look the other way. But uh, now this most recent crisis has forced him to have to uh, uh, negotiate and send his team, uh, his foreign minister and the ambassador there in Mexico, I'm sorry, in Washington, uh, had to negotiate. While Trump was in Europe, they had to go to the White House and meet with uh, Pompeo and, uh, and, and uh, you know, other top officials. But Interestingly, given the uncertainty of U.S. foreign policy, you know, Trump is sending out tweets and, you know, he's got his uh, BP and his other cabinet officials and acting uh, Homeland Security uh, uh, Secretary having to try to negotiate when they don't even know what the position is or, or, or what it, you know, what the president wants. So very interesting. Uh, you know, we now have uh, the announcement just in the last few days of a, of a new deal that's been made, but a lot of confusion because, uh, you know, what do we have? What is the deal other than Mexico having a commitment to beef up and, and, and take on the question of Central American migrants more? Uh, we're still just teasing out some of the puzzles, a lot of back and forth. Perhaps you've seen in the media that, you know, Trump announced a deal and many others in the media saying, well, the agreements that were, you know, said to have been made had already been made months back. And so what is new about this deal? Uh, but more than that, and I'd like to unravel in our conversation some of the aspects particularly from Mexico's side, that are going to be challenging because both the U.S. and Mexico will face logistical hurdles uh, to try to you know, carry out some of these promises. Uh, and, of course, one of them is Mexico has apparently agreed to deploy a newly formed National Guard, uh, which, uh, as I'll suggest right now, it doesn't even exist yet, but the idea is that this uh, new uh, National Guard is going to be set to, sent to intercept and possibly deport migrants who cross the southern border uh, with Guatemala. Uh, and Mexico doesn't have this force to, uh, yet uh, trained and ready to deal with uh, uh, asylum seekers, et cetera. So it's going to be interesting, among other things, to see how that plays out. Uh, that's one aspect. Beyond that, you know, Mexico's own capacity to absorb what are, quite frankly, large, growing number of migrants is becoming quite an issue, both at the border and as well, both the southern border and, you know, in the border cities there as they wait to try to get processed into the U.S. So major capacity issues for Mexico. Uh, let me add one last thing, and that is that, you know, for Mexico, uh, of course, a top priority is uh, a commitment to address uh, development assistance and aid in Central America, what, what is seen as the source of the problem. In other words, if they're fleeing violence and underdevelopment and poverty, the solution has to be helping those countries get out of that. Uh, the U.S. has not seen that as a top priority. And even if you recall a few months ago, President Trump announcing he was going to cut off all aid to Central America if they didn't behave or do something uh if anything that would probably make the situation worse it's not clear what he wants you know but he wants he wants to make it somebody else's problem not his problem he doesn't want to take any responsibility it goes back to you know the whole thing about the wall we'll have mexico pay for the wall really billions and billions and was there any commitment for that was there even any discussion about that no we'll have mexico pay for the wall uh, the other the other sort of cultural strain in Trump's administration is we make agreements, except nobody knows what they are. Secret agreements, if you will. That's my favorite part. It reminds me of all these elements of secrecy around his agreement with Kim Jong Un uh, the first time, which actually wasn't an agreement. And then we have another a meeting, a nothing burger meeting in, in uh, Singapore, and that was not an agreement. So we don't have an agreement. We, you know, this is all charade, it seems like to me. And then, you know, when, when, when the New York Times called him 
on the fact that these principal points, as you mentioned, were agreed before, and that Mexico would undertake those things. Then he says, well, no, it's not that. It's not that. What a lie. It's not that. He says, it's a secret agreement. But then they asked him, what are the terms of the secret agreement? Can presidents make secret agreements and keep them from the public? What kind of, you know, what kind of, uh, what kind of really old time nonsense is that? Demagoguery. Uh, so so uh, have you heard anything about a secret agreement, Carlos? Well, you know, today in the in the White House lawn, he was pressed by a group of reporters and he whips out a little piece of paper from his uh, you know, pocket and waves it, a folded paper saying, here's the secret agreement. Uh, now, uh, apparently what the agreement is that basically they're going to meet in 45 days. And if Mexico hasn't done enough, they're going to be requested to do more like the next level. Uh, but uh, as best we can tell, and, and here again, mixed signals, the Mexican government comes back and is saying some different things, uh, uh, among other things, Trump, for example, uh, made uh, some reference in his tweets that Mexico had agreed to buy more agricultural products. Here, the foreign minister saying, no, agriculture was not on the agenda of our discussion. And so a lot of inconsistencies. Uh, and I think it, it what, it, what it boils down to, and we've seen it, whether you, like you said, on North Korea, on, you know, whether it's with China or other issues, uh, what we might describe as Trump's policy is first, create a crisis. Number two, the media responds and goes berserk. Number three, try to solve it and then take credit for having solved the problem that you created to begin with. So this issue with with Mexico, again, it's, uh, you know, he's using it in many different ways, putting all of his babies together. Migration or immigration is one of his hot issues. Of course, trade, you know, the U.S. being ripped off, you know, NAFTA, the worst deal on the planet. He negotiates a NAFTA 2.0, which you know has some valuable. It hasn't been you know ratified yet, but it has some important upgrades and changes. But it is simply a you know a, a new version of NAFTA if it gets through. And of course, this most recent crisis suggests that even in the U.S. Congress, it's gotten more difficult. I think there's a real risk that if Mexico continues to be bullied uh, here, there will be real pressure to say, why should we sign a, a change? Because frankly, no change means that the current NAFTA that we've had for 25 years continues. Can't just overnight eliminate that. That, that. that involves a whole nother process. So like he has said, he's going to somehow uh, trash or eliminate NAFTA. It's not that easy. I mean, yes, he, he can impose tariffs and pain and suffering. But um, this other deal that was negotiated last year, again, in a very similar heightened tension, um, hasn't been ratified because uh, the Mexican Congress here is new. They haven't taken it up. The Senate there in the U.S. has not taken it up. The Canadian our, uh, um, the parliament has not taken it up. So his so-called deal making, uh, there's a lot, a lot to, remains to be seen. Well, so it's all grandstanding. And, uh, you know, the, the newspapers, uh, the responsible ones, have pointed this <clears throat> out that he, as you said, he creates the crisis. He solves the crisis. He calls himself a winner. This happens over and over again. You know, the M.O. is so clear. And I wonder if anybody buys it anymore. I mean, what the, what the press has been saying, the press I read anyway, in the last few days is we, we know the story. We know what he does. The narrative is always the same and it's always a crock. Uh, so d don't yeah. we realize that? Why do we buy it again and again? Somebody has got to call his bluff on this. And maybe the yeah. people who have to call his bluff on this are the other countries uh, that, you know, that he is lambasting this way. And, 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 you know, as easy as that might be to say, the, the reality for a country like Mexico, it is the weaker partner. This is a very asymmetrical relationship. It always has been. The U.S. has, you know, for many, many years in this relationship, been the heavy handed, big bully pushing around its way, not in the same way that Trump is doing now. This is obviously a very almost a mean spirited bully. Uh, but in general, the U.S. has always gotten Mexico to sort of comply and, 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 and hold it to uh, certain things uh, because Mexico needs the U.S more than the U.S. needs Mexico. And, and Donald Trump understands that. So he sees this tariff war as a clear way of squeezing Mexico to make some commitments. Uh, and Mexico has had to. Uh, the, the president here is put in an untenable position because there's so much at risk. Uh, if the economy goes into a tailspin, he is suddenly unable to address you know, his policy agenda. Um, but it has a real risk also of, I think, a lot of pushback uh, uh, of anti-Americanism. I mean, it's always been there and it always is there, especially in Mexico's foreign policy. But uh, even today, I think uh, I, I, you know, in, in dialogues here and in the social media, you see a, a growing disenchantment, you know, let's boycott American goods. Let's, you know, easier said than done because Mexico is wholly dependent on the U.S. for its exports, for its imports. However, um, 
you know, you mentioned earlier places like Russia and China. Uh, China is a player here. It is not on the level that it is in South America. You have uh, countries like Peru and Bolivia, even Venezuela, where China is becoming the major top foreign investor, m mainly countries that have uh, minerals and, and natural resources. Uh, but uh, in Mexico, it is here, but it doesn't have the same dependence, partly because the U.S. is so much more uh, significant, obviously through NAFTA. NAFTA has deepened that integration uh, of the three economies, Mexico with Canada into the U.S. Uh, but I can assure you there is you know, a growing sentiment that Mexico needs to try to move away from this heavy, heavy dependence. Uh, again, easier said than done because, uh, you know, uh, the system is set up to to perpetuate and, and continue this high interdependence. Well, you uh, have, but you China have. is. You we, know. we were all led to believe a few weeks ago that Trump had a deal. This is before any discussion of the five to twenty five percent tariffs. Mm -hmm. That Trump had a deal. He came out. He said, "I've I've succeeded yet again. I've succeeded. We have a deal with Mexico. We worked it out." Uh, and then all of a sudden, we didn't have a deal. Uh, and now, then all of a sudden, he's doing the 5 to 25 percent tariffs, and he's claiming that Mexico is not doing its job, uh, and now we need to make another deal. Uh, you know, I, that surprised me because I, I felt that um, we already had a deal. He negotiated a deal. And what, what I get from this president is that, you know, when he tells you he has a deal, you can't believe him. There is no deal. Um, and he uses this discussion of, of, the, of, of the deal, this lie about a deal, um, as a technique for, you know, getting on the headlines yet again. Um, so, yeah. you know, am I right about this, Carlos? It seemed to me that what he was saying and, and what Mexico might have been celebrating, even without knowing what the deal was, was, was like three or four weeks ago, there was a deal. And all of a sudden, there wasn't a deal. It's double think. Yeah. Uh, you know, what, what I get also yeah. is that in these tariff situations, um, he wants to go back to NAFTA uh, without even knowing what NAFTA said. And the same thing in the Trans-Pacific Trans Agreement. Um, he wants to do these multi, rather, he wants to do these uh, bilateral, bilateral tariff negotiations instead of multi-tariff. He doesn't understand what the multi was or is. He just pulls out of it because at some fundamental, visceral level, he thinks he's going to do better bullying one country at a time. Am I right? What's your thought about that? Well, absolutely. I mean, he and in, in now two and a half years into the president, he has had a clear disdain for any multilateralism and for basically the, the system that's been in place now over the last 75 years uh, after World War II, we established and the U.S. Uh, basically set up this system of, of uh, multilateral institutions, cooperation, coordination in the post-Cold War period. That's what it's been characterized by. Uh, I suppose, I don't know, I mean, you can read into it, maybe it's his real estate background where, you know, he makes the deals directly and, and he prefers that one-to-one. -one. The reality of the global economy is that by the U.S. Uh, taking itself out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership you mentioned, it has weakened the U.S. position. It has given more strength to China, uh, in, particularly in that Asia-Pacific region, uh, et cetera. Uh, and his, you know, you see him when he goes to these uh, uh, multilateral conferences. He's obviously so uncomfortable. Uh, he, you know, he... he doesn't doesn't do well in those kind of settings, and uh, you know, and has this idea that he can make better deals. Well, uh, we're we're clearly by now seeing that these so-called deals uh, leave a lot to be said. And 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 you know, with the case of Mexico, I mean, they've been pushed against the wall, and this tariff threat, a very you could almost say an existential threat for Mexico. Uh, it had very little choice and very little uh, ability to to get anything out of it other than to hope for the best and. So when the announcement was made just a few days ago here, it's like, ah, oh, a sigh of relief. And the, the government here trying to put its best spin on it. Uh, they even uh, uh, arranged this past Saturday after the deal was announced Friday. Uh, the president uh, brought a lot of governors and business leaders to Tijuana to have a big rally of their own and somehow to claim that Mexico had saved its dignity and, 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 and you know, a way of trying to bring out the best spin on it. Now, like Trump here, I mean, he has uh, the president here is quite popular. I should I should make that clear although uh, polarizing in his own way, but he has a very large base. And, you know, these are you know, not so interested in the nuance and details of, of, uh, of policy, but more they just see him as representing a, a radical shift from the past, uh, past system. Uh, and, uh, and yet this is a president who does, much like Trump is uncomfortable and multilateral, this new president in Mexico, Lopez Obrador, is not a very globally oriented person. He speaks no English. He has no interest in traveling outside of the country. He sold the president's presidential plane. Uh, he's already announced he's not going to go to the G20 meeting, which you know, many have seen as, you know, this is one of Mexico's forums where they can be a leader of the developing countries. Uh, but he 
is also very uncomfortable, I think, in, in, in addressing foreign policy issues. Uh, and yet this issue made it hard for him to, to get around it. He had to deal and, and send his team to try and negotiate. But in the end, negotiate with a very powerful, larger player, and in this case, a bully who, who, who in the form of Trump, has been able to push through some uh, agreements that Mexico is now mm -hmm. committed to do. But again, no details. Uh, we don't have a, yeah. you know, a, a, public, a publicly released statement. A, com a comment on real estate negotiation you referred to earlier, and I think, I think that does define him. Um, you know, in, in his real estate practice, I think probably well known um, that w what he would do is, um, is never make the deal. Always do a change up, always surprise everyone and keep on moving the ball so no one knew where his position, bargaining position is. So you could never make a deal. And people would get very frustrated. You know, the opposite negotiators would get very frustrated. Uh, they would see him do these bizarre and threatening things. And then they would say to themselves, my God, we're, we're, we're locked in with this guy, but he, he's unable to make a deal, doesn't want to make a deal. So they get very hungry to make any deal at all. And they wind up chasing him in order to make a deal they think. You know, it's like, you know, the old rule of practicing law and negotiating is you never make two offers in a row um, because, because that means you're chasing the other guy's position. Can't do that. You have to have, make, a, yeah, make a proposition. Yeah. The other guy makes a counter offer and so forth. Um, but he, he's one of these guys that never makes a real offer because it's, you know, it's mm -hmm. always a fake offer. And, and, this, and mm -hmm. doing this on a diplomatic level is very problematic because it leaves the president of Mexico and Mexico in general in a real pickle. How do they negotiate with that? So I'm, I'm getting from what you say that uh, the president of Mexico doesn't want to go to the G20, which is only in a week or two, right? It's coming up right away. Yeah, um, yeah. He doesn't want to go there because he doesn't want to spend time with this shadow boxing kind of negotiation with Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, and well, my, well, my question I, I, to you, I, I, Carlos, is what should he do? What should Mexico do at this point to you know, secure its own future? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. And let, let me make clear, he, his decision, uh, the president of Mexico's decision not to go to G20 doesn't have much to do with Trump. It's his own uneasiness with you know, foreign affairs uh, and, you know, his priority to address the, the domestic here. Um, and now, beyond that, what can Mexico do? I mean, my sense is that they really uh, I, I think they should be reaching out to other allies, to Canada, to other Latin Americans, to Europeans, to try to, you know, somehow gain some support uh, for their position. Uh, you know, in this crisis over the Central Americans, for example, for the Mexicans, it's all about human rights. It's about the poverty and, and, and inequality and, and uh, you know, that crisis. Um, and so those are issues that for the U.S. are more secondary. For the U.S., it's all about just stopping the flow and, and you know, the illegal, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, the asylum seekers, et cetera. But um, here I think Mexico is, is also troubled because they don't have a very clearly defined foreign policy agenda. Uh, even the domestic policy, which is his priority, he's got certain areas, but it's also very muddled. The president came to office without having to spell out a lot of details other than to say he's going to end corruption, he's going to change the way they do business, and he is. He's a different style, no question about that. But it remains to be seen if he's going to be successful. Unfortunately, in this relationship with the U.S., he, you know, I think another advice that he's taken, which I think is also good, is not to pay as much attention to Trump when you don't have to. Of course, when when you're being threatened with tariffs, you have to somehow stand up and, and figure out what to do, but not to get in a shouting match, not to somehow even directly confront him. And so uh, that uh, that strategy of somehow keeping it under the radar and, uh, and ignoring him is really what they've tried to do here. That's tragic because can. it's not a negotiation of equals that way. Uh, and, I, no, and I think no. largely what Trump is doing is playing a racist game with Mexico, as with other countries. But you mentioned earlier uh, Mexico's ability to absorb uh, the migrants and people who are seeking shelter and sanctuary from the Central America. It's a big problem. And no. uh, actually, the yes. U.S. could do something to solve that problem. What Trump is doing is the reverse. He's doing whatever he can to exacerbate that problem. Uh, anyway, they're coming no. across your southern border from Guatemala. Um, they, they have a lot of trouble get, getting through Mexico and getting to the U.S. southern border. Um, and uh, where, where, uh, where are they winding up? And can Mexico, does Mexico have the resources uh, and the political will to take care of them? Um, and how does this affect uh, you know, Mexican society when you have this, this hole in the boat where you really can't solve a problem that keeps on happening? 
No. Well, yeah, a couple of quick things. And on one hand, Mexico is, I think, reaching a, a point of uh, capacity, uh, an ability to, to just deal with this. Uh, it, I mentioned this uh, newly formed National Guard. It, it exists on paper. It's basically barely getting in the, in the, you know, put together. In February, the Congress passed a new law and the president came to office with this idea because, as you well know, there's been such a you know, rise of violence here for the last 20 years. Uh, criminal organizations, the narco cartels, and Mexico about 10, 11, maybe 12 years ago now, 13 years ago, uh, under a previous president, they basically put the military into the drug uh, war, and that basically corrupted the military. Before that, the military was relatively free of corruption. The police has always had that. And so with this no notorious corruption in the police and the military, his idea was, well, we're going to create this new National Guard well, what is the National Guard? It's basically former military, former federal police that are giving a new note, given a new uniform, but they are a new entity, again, still in the works, haven't been trained yet. Uh, although the, the agreement uh, that was announced says now that they're going to send 6,000 of these National Guard to the border. Really, again, they're just military that have been, you know, given a new, new, new color uniform. Yeah, it had nothing but to do with human rights and there's nothing to do with well, social safety net and taking care of, yeah. of people who are disadvantaged. What is Mexico? Yeah, what and, can Mexico do about that? Yeah. Well, that, that's, again, part of the idea of this guard is that they're supposed to be trained different, different from police, different from military, to address human rights issues, to address maybe more the social uh, you know, conditions and so on. But you can't just put on a switch and you know, take a military who's been trained you know, how to kill and use deadly force and suddenly give them a few you know, crash courses and PowerPoints on how to defend human rights. So. Uh, it's not going to be a solution uh, that's going to happen right away or soon. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, there's a, a quick point I wanted to say is that there's a sense down here that Mexico, once again, is being asked to do the dirty work for Mexico, to be the one that has to close that southern border uh, and basically, you know, be the nasty one to deport them all. Mexico has been doing that actually now since uh, about January. I think there have been 11,000 uh, migrants that have come through that have been uh, de deported back. Uh, and it's a real challenge of Mexico's capacity. Uh, and again, when you look at the fear and uncertainty about the economy with, with the threats of tariff, you know, Mexico's capacity would be even hindered more to, to be able to do that. And another final point is that by moving uh, these troops that, or this new force that doesn't even exist towards the southern border, it is taking them away from where they would otherwise be addressing the criminal organizations and networks and drug cartels. So this happened actually some years ago under Obama, about four or five years ago, similar pressure to stop the flow of, you know, unaccompanied minors that began coming. Well, they did stop that, but it also meant there was a void and a vacuum in other parts where violence suddenly went up. So uh, very challenging issues. Well, I, think, I think one point I take from that is that this has an effect on Mexican society and Mexican mm -hmm. politics, on, Mex on the Mexican economy, mm -hmm. even though it's just been a, a war of words so far and a war of, well, Trump making lies hither and yon. Uh, fact is, all of that has a terrifically negative effect. Mm -hmm. And right now, I would say the United States policy toward Mexico is a complete train wreck, a complete train wreck on mm -hmm. both sides of the border. I mean, after all that noise about how we now needed all these billions of dollars and needed to nationalize the National Guard, you know what he has them doing? He has them painting the fence, painting the fence. You can't get a contractor to do that. He's got the army painting the fence. And to me, that is symblem, symbol, symbol, emblematic of the, the, the train wreck. But let me ask you one last question, and then we got to go. And that is, what do you see in the future on this? How is this going to play out? It's not clear that he's going to be, you know, thrown out of office in November um, next year. Um, but, you know, what, what is going to happen here? Uh, it, it doesn't paint a good picture right now. Uh, and I wonder what your thoughts are looking forward. Uh, you're right in the middle of Mexico. You see it all. Yeah. What do you think is going to happen, yeah. Carlos? You know, I, I see this so-called deal that, again, we don't have many details about is simply kicking the can down the road again. Uh, they're, they're said to be meeting again in 45 days to assess, you know, has Mexico done enough? And, well, you know, frankly, the... What I see happening here and many here in Mexico, particularly the more, you know, uh, uh, you know, more informed intellectual elites uh, recognizes as it's a way of Trump diverting attention to all the crises he has from, you know, the investigations and, and other, uh, you know, domestic politics there. Uh, and so this becomes an easy whipping tool to somehow draw attention to this and whip up the base, you know, because immigration is a powerful force and uh, and, 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 and the trade issue and, and his ability, as much as we may not like it, 
he can claim, whether you know the details are right or wrong, uh, he can claim that he has now pressured Mexico to agree to do certain things, whether they agreed already or whatever. Uh, let me add just finally that here within Mexico, uh, you know, in general, there has been support for the migrants uh, that are coming through. They understand that Mexico is a transit country. And this new government has even opened up in the early days of January, February, offering them work visas, offering them opportunities to stay. But as this crisis continues and gets difficult to manage, uh, there's also a, a you know a fair amount of discrimination and resentment in in parts of Mexico towards the Central Americans. Many of them are stuck on the borders now, and and you know a big city like Tijuana and maybe Ciudad Juarez they can absorb a fair number as they always have, but it's reaching a boiling point, and and you're gonna probably I can predict you're gonna see probably some violence erupting more in some of these uh, you know shelters and places that don't have a capacity. The Mexican government doesn't have a capacity, so today we have mostly religious groups and NGOs that are servicing this large migrant population. And the solution for the US is they want Mexico to take care of all the dirty problems, to process the asylum seekers here, to hold them uh, basically as a sort of uh, a safe third country uh, you know, agreement that they're still trying to unravel. Uh, it's a mess and it doesn't look like it's gonna be solved anytime soon. Uh, I can anticipate we're gonna see this more on the agenda in the you know weeks and months ahead and it will remain on the political agenda for the US. And for this new president here, uh, he would probably have hoped to keep his focus on domestic politics. Uh, this issue is going to continue to challenge him uh, and, and without any easy solutions. Well, thank you, Carlos. It's a dreadful picture. I hope things improve. And I look forward to talking with you again on uh, Global Connection. Uh, so nice to have your input on this issue. Such an important issue. Thank you so much, Carlos. Thank you and aloha. Aloha. <laughs>